faculty as well as students. And if there are any here that are working on your postgraduate work in uh, advanced degree, that would include you as well. All of us who spend time on this campus are in a dangerous place. Let me go back and uh, give you a little bit of background as to what prompted me to think uh, like this. A number of years ago, Cynthia and I decided we would uh, drive down to the place where we had uh, lived at that time most of our lives. We, we were uh, really reared in the city of Houston, so we chose to drive. We could talk together and, and uh, uh, visit along the way. We were at a sort of a high-pitched peak of activity and uh, felt like we needed to sort of slow our pace. So we did that. This was back in 1996. I had just uh, come to the school a couple of days, bef a couple of years before, returning as a part of the leadership of the school, and, and we had gone through an enormous series of changes, having left the role of the pastorate which I had filled since I graduated in 63. And uh, she was sort of in a no man's land. We were moving Insight for Living from California to uh, Texas. So she commuted for about six or seven years in the process, if you can imagine that. I said to her, there's something wrong when you know the airline personnel better than your neighbors uh, as a result of all the flying that we had been doing. Uh, and that, too, had added a stress to our, our marriage and our lives. So we thought we would go back to the place of our roots, which we did. Uh, it was wonderful. We, uh, we didn't check into our hotel right away, but deliberately spent time uh, driving roads. We had driven not just dozens, but hundreds of times in our early years. We, we drove to campuses of schools we had attended and, and uh, in front of and even got out and visited in churches that we had gone to in the, the church where we had been married back in 1955. We, uh, we loved it. Uh, we held hands like a couple of teenagers, uh, enjoying walking slower together and, and lingering in places where there were memories that just swarmed over us. It was a sort of a journey down Nostalgia Avenue for us. I'll never forget uh, some of those moments when I heard Bill talk about uh, what he's going through with Shirley, uh, my heart was touched over what you've lost with her loss of health. And, uh, and because of all of these emotions that have sort of swarmed around me lately, I've, I've come to realize that uh, over the passing of time, through the establishing of habits built on a fast pace and the uh, responsibility and requirements of earning a degree, just as you can in a marriage, you can, you can cool off, you can lose what I would call uh, your touch of intimacy with the Savior. I'm concerned about that for you. When your notes as faculty members begin to yellow with age, because you've taught that course more times than you can recall, I'm concerned for you. Not that there's anything wrong with those years, there's everything right about them, it's just that they bring with them the, the threat of its becoming a perfunctory 
job. And you were never, you were never hired to do a job. You were called to be here. It's a calling. Uh, you students are called to be on this campus. And I have a feeling that uh, much of what drove you to that calling was a zeal. Uh, a zeal for the lost. Uh, for the campus where you once were and and, and the students you had the privilege of sharing Christ with. And most of them you didn't. And you think about that. And you remember too, don't you, uh, when you first were getting into the scriptures and you would open the Bible and it was a thrill. There was an excitement about discovery of truth. And now you're on a campus where this book is the textbook. And your, your time in it, if you're not careful, will become mainly an academic exercise. And I, I understand. I, uh, I understand this responsibility of earning this degree and all that goes with that. But I can't help but remember the, uh, the great church at Ephesus. And if I read Revelation 2, 1 through 7 correctly, I, I find the kind of church you or I would have wanted to attend. It was discerning, it was doctrinally sound. They didn't have time for any, any uh, pretense or phony baloney. They, they understood the truth. I mean, they had had their lives honed by people like Paul and Aquila and Priscilla and uh, the Apostle John. You can't get better than that in your training and your learning and your growing up in the faith. And then right in the middle of this uh, brief profile of this grand church in Ephesus, uh, John drops in, verse 4, a concern he has for them. Remember it? I have this against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. One of the versions says, you have left your first love. It doesn't say they didn't love him. It says that the love had changed. Cynthia and I loved each other years into our marriage. And after now 59 years together, our love is deep and long standing. But if we're not careful over the years, it can change, which prompted our journey to the place of our roots, sitting out in front of the Houses where she lived and where I lived. Even drove through the old Washburn Tunnel, which I'd been through more times than I want to remember. And, and uh, along that old ship channel, when the fog would hang low as I would leave her home late at night to go back to my place. Uh, longing for the day that I could call her my wife. And loving her with an intensity that uh, lacked the ability to put into words. Adored her. And she and I talked while we were together on this journey about how we felt when we stood together at the altar of that little Baptist church where two pastors participated in our ceremony. And all those people who sang. I mean, our wedding was like an operetta. We had seven, eight songs. I thought we'd never get to the important part and <laughs> get out of there. And uh, 
I mean, it, it was just it was just passionate how how profound our love was for each other. And then years began to stack up. Had no idea when we married that I'd be away from her for 14, 16 months on the island of Okinawa in the Marine Corps. We had, I had no idea I'd be in graduate school. No idea that, that they would uh, allow me to be on this campus and to study under people like this and to, and to sit in the, 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 the chapel and, and the seats in those classrooms. And sometime after the classes were over, I just stayed there. I just couldn't get it in enough. And I noticed over time, along came, of course, a child and then another, and we lost two and then another and then another. And, uh, and changes occurred in churches. We served different as far as New England to California. And uh, in the middle of it, twice in Texas. And, uh, there our marriage was, rolling on, at times cooling off. I mean, I knew the Bible better than I'd ever known it. I'd studied here, and uh, I was able to develop gifts that God had given me, and I, I had no idea what the future held. No idea I'd ever write any book. Or that anybody ever read one that I wrote. That's another thing I certainly didn't plan on. And getting on the radio and all. If you knew the background of that, you'd laugh. I mean, it wasn't the fulfillment of a plan or a dream. It was sort of uh, coming into it like C.S. Lewis describes in Surprised by Joy. Sort of kicking and screaming into every, every change. I didn't want to come back to the campus as the president. I wasn't qualified to be the president. Uh, I was convinced that they really got the wrong number. So I said no several times, and, and they wouldn't give up. And then I, I couldn't believe the faculty would accept me as a president, or that I'd ever found a church. I'm not going to found another one, I'll tell you that. That's, <laughs> that is a mess when you get into that. And all of this, all of this takes a toll on you. It takes a toll on your home. It takes a toll on your marriage. And, and uh, at times you, uh, you look at your children, you can't believe they've, they've grown like that. And where were you? I was involved in all the things of ministry, all of them good, every one of them good. But I, I, I look at this, statement, you don't love me or each other as you did at first, and I'm haunted by that. I want you to stay in love with Christ. I, I want you to have such an intimacy in your relationship with him that you can, without even bowing your head or closing your eyes, just talk to him. Just connect with him. Just pour out your soul of your, your fears and your, and your heartaches and your uneasiness, your disappointments and your offenses and your mistakes and your failures and your successes and your great grades and your poor grades and all through it that your intimacy with him just intensifies, gets deeper and deeper. So that when you leave, you, you, don't, you, you don't leave loving the text of Scripture. You, love, you, you leave loving the person of Scripture. The person of Scripture. Who loved you and gave himself for you and loved you enough to give you his book and to preserve it in your language and the other languages you're going to learn and there's everything right about that. I love the languages. And I love digging into them. That was part of my problem. I just, I loved all of it. And my heart was hardly big enough to have room for all the, all the people I needed to keep loving. 
You understand what I'm saying here? I think you do. When I read uh, different individuals' rendering of this statement in Revelation 2.4, I get an even better grasp of it. A.T. Robertson. This early love, proof of their new life in Christ, had cooled off in spite of their doctrinal purity. If you don't watch it, it's going to cool off. And your zeal for the lost is not going to be as intense as it was in your university years. If you don't watch it, your, your affection for him will get academic. And you'll know the text so well, but But your love will have become cold. John R. W. Stott says, They had fallen from the early heights of devotion to Christ, which they had climbed. They had descended to the plains of mediocrity. In a word, they were backsliders. The hearts of the Ephesian Christians had chilled. Isn't that a great word? Chilled. By the way, 30 years had passed since Paul had written them that last line in the letter to the Ephesians. Don't know the last time you glanced at it, but that last line refers to their loving him. Loving him in, in a deep love. 30 years have passed and they've already begun to cool off. Same church. Many of them remembering the, the voice of Paul and John and Aquila and Priscilla and those who had built their lives into them. And, and, and they're now standing for the faith. They have a fortitude, but they, but they don't have a deep, intimate affection for the Savior. Don't lose that. Don't, don't lose that. It was Paul's passion. He says so in Philippians chapter 3 it is. Philippians 3. I want to know Christ. The New Living Translation. I want to experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him. Sharing in his death. Back when I was in the Marines, one of the early uh, paraphrases that began to be passed around was the Amplified Bible. And my, my mentor with the Navigators, Bob Newkirk, put a copy of it in my hand. He said, here, Chuck, you'll, you'll love this, this version of the Bible. And uh, he had circled Philippians 3.10. Listen to it in the Amplified. For my determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately, there's that word again, more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, Perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. And that I may in the same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection. I'll be 80 years old in October. I have no plans to retire. Retirement stinks. And so I, I have... My great goal is to have my chin hit the pulpit on my way down. Just, right, <laughs> just lay me out right there. So I don't have any plans to retire. But I, I want to do it as long as I'm effectively able to do it. And the longer I do it, the more I want to love him. And the deeper I want to serve him. 
And the more intimately I want to understand him. And the more passionately I want to represent him. And I want to care less and less about the stuff of me. And more and more about him. I like the way the late songwriter Keith Green put it. My eyes are dry. My faith is old. My heart is hard. My prayers are cold. And you know how I ought to be alive to you. And dead to me. I want that. I want that for you. I want to know when you walk across that platform and you, you get your well-earned degree from, from this president who gives it to you with a smile and we all ultimately applaud you for your accomplishment. I want you to be able to say when you put your tassel on the other side of your cap, I love him now more than I love him, loved him when I came. I, I know he's worried better. I know you'll be able to say that. That's part of what concerns me. You'll fall in love with exegesis. As much as we believe in exegesis and the power of, of exposition and the significance of, of declaring the truth everywhere God takes us, there's everything right about that, but just keep loving him. Just keep staying intimate with him. I, I, I love the scene out of that first wedding where Adam and Eve are together. And it says that they were naked and they were not ashamed. There was an intimacy in their relationship that was so great. And so they were so preoccupied with the other that they didn't even realize they have any clothes on. Totally exposed, totally open, totally uh, vulnerable. And... and uh, I call that intimacy at its best. For you, by the time you have finished your years at this grand school, I don't know of a better one. By the time you finish your years here, you will have that kind of naked openness and intimacy with your Lord where you can say, I talk to him now like I've never talked to him before. Tozer put it well, may not the inadequacy of much of our spiritual experience be traced back to our habit of skipping through the corridor of the kingdom like children in the marketplace, always chattering about everything but pausing to learn the true value of nothing. You'll just chatter about everything on this campus. And you'll, you'll argue over the authorship of Hebrews. A waste of time, but you'll argue over the authorship <laughs> of Hebrews, and, and, and you'll, you'll do battle with some brother as he, you see him as an extreme Calvinist or moving toward him. In his, I understand all of that. That's all part of being a seminary. That's the dumb stuff you get involved in and, and you spend your time doing, and, and that's all part of it. That's all part of it. It isn't dumb. You know what I'm saying. But compared to loving him, it's dumb stuff. Amen. Nothing is more important then you're having this passion for Christ. And then when you walk away, you're, you're like you're on a cloud of excitement and enthusiasm wherever God may take you. It doesn't matter what money you make. It doesn't matter what fame you may have. It doesn't matter how large the ministry grows. It does not matter. All of that is up to him. What matters is your love. My marriage isn't based on how many kids we had. It's based on how deep our love is for each other. I mean, I know her so well I can finish her sentences. Sometimes do. <laughs> and just this morning, we had the most intimate conversation about something that's got her burdened. And I left her almost in tears. And I couldn't fix it. I love fixing it. I like fixing stuff. And uh, she said, don't try to fix it. But I drove away and, and I thought about uh, how long we've shared our lives together and the stuff we've been through. The heartbreaks, the disloyalty of some we thought were friends, and, and the ugly criticism of some people 
who don't even know us. And I, I, I thought, it takes a toll on you. Then I thought about the, the accomplishments we've been able to do together. And uh, I just, you mix it all together, it's called a marriage. It's called a love relationship. And as a result, you, you really are one. I, when I learned from Bill about Shirley's recent illness, I, I said to him, you know, I don't know what I do without Cynthia. She, she does all our finances. And he said, well, Shirley does mine. I said, uh, I don't like all those little numbers. And Cynthia does quicken. See, I think that's a big deal. I just don't want her to show me how to do it. <laughs> I want her to do it. And there's some things I do that she can't do and doesn't do. So we work it together. It's like teeth and gears. And the gear, and, and the gear isn't made to run by itself. It fits. And when you add the third gear of Jesus, it's remarkable how magnificent life becomes. It's just remarkable. My determined purpose is that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him. Every time I meet with you at the chapel services, there will be six times, counting today, in these two semesters, I want to talk about another facet of, of this, uh, the discipline, the spirit of intimacy. Uh, I'll, I will talk with you about uh, simplicity and solitude and humility. I'll talk about self-control and sacrifice. These are things you're not going to get in the textbooks here. Now, that's not what textbooks are about. These are not academic subjects. The psalmist put it this way, as the deer pants for the water brook. My soul pants for you, O oh God. My soul pants for you. Job put it this way. He knows the way that I take. Job 23, 10 through 12. He knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot has held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I turned back from the command of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I pass up a meal to eat at this feast. Why? Because he has a, a deer's heart panting for the streams of water. I warn you, uh, men and women, God will not speed up so the two of you can walk together. You have to slow down. You've got to take time for it. Take time for it. Learn from my mistakes. I, I tried to pack too many hours into, into every semester. One semester, I took 21 hours. Stupid. <laughs> You're, you're looking at stupid. And we had a baby at home that didn't sleep through for 18 months. And my wife typed all, we, back then we typed our, our papers, that, 18 papers that, that semester. And by the way, I tell you, we, I, I audited rapid Greek reading from Toussaint. By the end of it, I called it rabid <laughs> Greek reading. Now I learned the Greek text, but I sure did. But I didn't get to know my, my boy better or love my wife more deeply. 
That's that constant tension, isn't it? I understand. That's why I'm concerned. If it's an easy fix, I'm not concerned. I just say fix it. But you're going to forever be dealing with this. So he won't speed up to, to walk with you. He won't scream and shout. You'll have to be quiet. That's why the psalmist says, be still and know that I'm God. You'll have to have some hours where you don't have a, an assignment in front of you. Where you deliberately and where you intentionally simply bow before him and wait upon him and pour out your soul to him. He won't work in the framework we establish. We must adapt to his. Pace. Style. Intimacy. A relationship marked by a warm friendship developing through long association of a very personal and private nature. I want that for you. I'm, I am deeply concerned that you may graduate without that. And so are these fine women and men who teach you and administer at this school. So let's make a deal. I promise you that I will continue to grow deeper and more intimate in my relationship with the Savior. And I want you to do the same thing. Let's do it a semester at a time. Let's do it this semester. Don't take it on for the next. You can only do a semester at a time, really a day at a time. Just make sure that you and he are on speaking terms and he really, really becomes your most intimate relationship. Promise him that. Let's bow together. It's a little hard to pray in a dangerous place, Lord. But perhaps this is the one place we need to do it the most. How valuable will be these years? How important these contacts? Our spiritual relationship with you and with one another, with our mates, with our family, with our parents, even extended family, how valuable all of this is. We did not come here to become monks. We came here, Lord, called by you to be fed and nurtured by you. Guard us, Father, from this great tendency to see it all as business as usual, especially for the, the, uh, the real sharp students, do I pray. So easy for them to be consumed in their own ability and even a growing arrogance and pride. I pray that you would do whatever necessary 
to break their hearts, to humble them. I pray now for faculty. And I pray that these fine men and women who know the text of Scripture better than any of us ever will, I pray that their love for you will outshine their knowledge of your truth. I pray that their lives will be marked by integrity, that they won't let us down with compromise, moral failure, or whatever may be the temptation that plagues them. Give them strength. May they become models without trying to be. May they serve you as your representatives so that we can learn how to do that from their example. Pray again for Shirley. I pray for Bill, who now discovers the role of caregiver in the middle of the night when he's seized with fear. I pray that you'd calm him. And in the heat of the day when he's exhausted, I pray that you'll strengthen him. And finally, Lord, for all of us who have a ring on our finger,